The word of life comes from one place today. That's Revelation chapter 3, verses 4 to 5. Revelation chapter 3, verses 4 to 5. Believing that you are there, I will read. And it reads, But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. This is the word of God. Amen. Good afternoon, Shiloh. Today is very, very cold, but I heard that today is actually the beginning day of the spring. And I pray that although the physical weather may be very cold, by the grace of God, that we are in the warmest place in the whole wide world, in the bosom of our Father God this afternoon. Amen? Okay, so thinking about being cold, let's talk about clothing. Okay. Thank you. Today's main passage comes from Book of Revelations. Its title is... Keep your white garments. This is from Book of Revelation, so already we get very serious, right? In Book of Revelation, God speaks to the churches in the end time, the last days. go like this. He speaks to seven churches in the end time. Now, this message about keeping the white garment is given to two churches. One church is called the dead church. I know you have a name that you're alive, but you're actually dead. This church called Sardis. And also, another church. This church is lukewarm church. To this lukewarm church, which is Laodicea, to both of these churches, Jesus warns, make sure you get yourself white garment. And make sure that when I come, that your nakedness, your shame is not found by covering yourself with this what garment? This white garment. And hence, Revelation chapter 16, verse 5 clearly states, when the Lord comes, he's going to come like a thief. And we must make sure we have this white garment. Okay? Let's turn to Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. On our slide. Okay. Let's read this together. Ready, begin. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his garments, lest he walks about naked and men sees his shame. Not only that, book of Revelation talks a lot about this garment, this white garment. For instance, Revelation chapter 7 speaks about this great white multitude that comes out from the tribulation, right? And also Revelation chapter 19 talks about the bride of the Lamb herself. The bride of the Lamb also wears this white linen. And also the army of the heaven has this white garment. So already we can see the importance of of having the white garment in the end time. Now, then let us trace back. When does this whole garment issue start from? All the way back to the beginning in the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, right? So Eden is whose garden? It's like God's house. 
Okay, let's say this is Garden of Eden here. In here in this God's garden, the first man and woman, according to Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, they were naked. But there was no shame. Remember in the book of Revelation, it keeps saying that you must make sure when I return, your nakedness and your shame not be found, right? But in the original world, people were naked, and yet there was no shame. And what happened in God's house, in God's garden of Eden? According to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, these people had special work. They were to keep the garden and cultivate. We'll get to this word, but word keep means shamar. Please remember that in Hebrew. Cultivate means abad. This word abad actually means to serve. Okay. However, because this man and woman did not serve God, but rather they served the voice of the serpent and therefore took this forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? Knowledge of good and evil. It becomes KGE here. And guess what happened? Their eyes opened. As soon as they took the fruit from tree of knowledge of good and evil, the first thing they noticed was, their nakedness. The first thing they did was to go and get them for some get for themselves this loin covering that is found in Genesis chapter three, uh, I believe, verse seven. Let's actually turn to this verse. Genesis chapter three, verse seven. Okay, let's check this verse. Ready, begin. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. And I believe this is probably the very first form of clothing for Bible here. Okay? But you know that this fig leaves do not stand long against the sunlight. And therefore, we see in Genesis chapter 3, verse 27, God makes them. I'll make sure. I'm 21, 21. God makes them clothes. God actually covers them with clothes called the garment of skin. And they are thrown out from the Garden of Eden. We call this the fall. And so here, this garment of skin in Hebrew word is actually quite amazing. Hebrew word for this garment is ketonet, the word ketonet. And this word is actually found in the priestly garment. The very basic clothing, the priest who served God, as we see here in Hebrew, ketonet, means tunic. It is actually a long covering clothes that covers all the way to your wrist and all the way down to your ankle. This is all again, again, what color? White garment. Okay. And this is made with garment of skin. So, you know, skin means leather. To get leather, you have to actually sacrifice an animal to get this, right? So here, this reality of mankind of wearing this ketonet is well illustrated in this book. This, is no, this book is known as Book of Revelation in the Old Testament, in Book of Zechariah. This book, if the revelation was talked ab about the church in the end time, and Genesis is about God's garden, God's house in the beginning, this book is actually talking about the temple building. And we're going to look at Zechariah chapter 3. 
here shows a priest named Joshua in chapter 3 wearing, I'm going to have to draw this, a garment. But this is not a clean garment. This is a filthy garment. So his face is not happy. On top of that, there is a devil, Satan. I'm just being a little childish. <laughs> Satan, really, the verse says in Genesis, uh, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, Satan is standing right next to him, Joshua, the priest, and the Lord stands here. So Joshua is standing in front of God. Satan, right next to him, he's wearing this filthy garment. Actually, this filthy garment in Hebrew is uh, begadim, begadim. This word comes from bagad, means unfaithfulness, faithlessness. Okay, So he's wearing this filthy garment, and you know, he cannot get away with this because Satan is pointing, hurling at him for his faithless, faithlessness, his filthiness, right? Guess what God does here? What does God do? He rebukes Satan. Who is wrong here? Satan is right, right? But still, God rebukes Satan and says, Lord, who chose Israel, rebukes you. And he commands, put a festal robe on Joshua. Okay? Joshua did not do anything. He's just standing right in front of the Lord. This is face, okay, guys? This time, this is a festal robe. So it's all nice and clean, shiny, okay? And God says to put a clean turban on him. Okay. This is in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. Do we have that verse there? Okay, let's read this together. How good is this, Lord? Let's read this together. Ready, begin. Remove the filthy garments from him. Again, the Lord says to him, see, I have taken your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with festal robes. Oh, how does my heart just tremble with joy? Knowing that Joshua did not do anything, but God, by his unexplainable sovereign grace, takes away this filthiness of Joshua, and just right on him, this beautiful festal robe, like the robe you wear when you go to big banquet or party, right? And that's why the man of God, David, says, how blessed is a man whose sin is taken away without doing all the work, right? Brothers and sisters, I believe this is a story for you and I this morning, this afternoon, right? Let's turn to Romans chapter 4, verse 6 through 7. Let's check this in with our own eyes, this blessed verse. Romans chapter 4, verse 6 through 7. Ready, begin. Just as David also speaks of the blessing upon the man to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven, whose sins have been covered. Amen, right? This is truly the blessing. Does this require our works? No. This is called atoning grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what happens once we are in this state, this blessing? We have received the righteousness, right? So God gives a special grant to this Joshua, now wearing this festal robe and clean turban. Okay. That's Zechariah chapter 3, verse 9. Uh, verse 7, verse 7. Let's see. God says this to Joshua. If you will walk in my ways and if you will perform my service, then you will also govern my house and also have charge of my courts and I will grant you free access among those who are standing here. So God is saying he's going to give him the special privilege to, to do things where? At God's house. All right? And if you refer back to the verse, can we go back to the slide? I want you to point out these words in Hebrew. 
perform my service, right? The word perform my service and the word charge of my courts, same Hebrew word is used. Also, walk in my ways and free access, same Hebrew word. Let's check those words out. First, God says, if you walk in my ways, right, I'm going to give you free access, right? The walk is halak in Hebrew. Same word that's found when, that, when the Bible portrays that God is walking in his garden for the first time in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. God is saying he's going to allow, uh, back again, the same, same benefit, same free access, malek. If you look at the Hebrew word, the halak, the form is there still, right? God is going to allow this Joshua wearing the festal robe, this free access in where? Wherever God's presence is, right? Also, the second Hebrew word, perform my service. Perform my service is serving God, right? Perform my service is shamar. Remember the same word that we saw in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, when God commanded Adam to do? And also God says, if we shamar his service, he will let us shamar God's court, right? You see, these great blessings that God has granted to Joshua. Putting righteousness means you have no, you no longer have sin, right? When Joshua did not do any work that deserves it, this great blessing with this comes free access to where? I love this phrase, free access to where? Right? Just now, Zechariah chapter 3, 7 portrays everything about how God's garden was in the original way. Okay. It's so amazing. Zechariah is a chapter, especially chapter 3. Zechariah, a whole chapter was written to stir up and motivate the heart of the Israelites to rebuild God's temple. And God shows this great vision. It says, now, Zech, now the Joshua wearing this festal robe, in front of him, there is a, a stone laid in front of him. This is a very, very special stone. It's got seven eyes, which represents the eyes of God, the spirits of God. Okay. And he says, on this day, he will wipe away all the iniquity of the land. See, we are talking about Book of Zechariah, which happened thousands of years ago. That's what we think, right? But here, God foreshadowed on the day of Zechariah to the Israelites who were building the Zerubbabel Temple, right? God told them, God prophesied to them, one day, I'm really going to make this come true. This one day, when a stone is laid in front of Joshua... That day, I'm going to engrave on the stone, and on that day, on that one day, I'm going to wipe out all the sin, just as I've done to you. Here's good news. That one day has actually come. We are living that day. Our fathers of faith already lived through this day. What is this one day? This one day is referring to the day when the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross. By his crucifixion, by shedding of his precious blood that has no sin, he has wiped away all of the sins of mankind already once and for all. It's been already done. It's finished. It's teleoed, perfected, right? And we are living in this great blessings. We do not deserve to be here. We also have the filthy garment. We have not done anything, but God says, I have already put upon you the garment. Let us turn to uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse, uh, let's go to Zechariah chapter 3 verse 9 first. Zechariah chapter 3 verse 9. Okay, let's read this together. Important verse. Ready, begin. For behold, the stone that I have set before Joshua, on one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave an inscription on it, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. And that one day has already come, as we see in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Next verse, please. Ready, begin. In him, 
We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. It was gift to us, to all of us, to all mankind on the earth already. Amen. And guess there's even something more amazing has happened on this day. When Jesus was crucified, right, on Luke chapter 23, verse 45, his flesh was torn, right, on that very moment in the temple of God. The veil to the most holy place was torn from top to the bottom, therefore giving the free access into the most holy place where nobody could enter, right? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 20, also in our verse. Okay, ready, begin. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter where? The holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. Hallelujah, right? So what happened? By this crucifixion of our Lord, when his flesh was torn, the veil was torn, and he is also made a new living way. Back to the most holy place where God himself dwells, right? If this is a fall that our human race has lived through, our Lord Jesus Christ has already opened the new way, the way of restoration, the new and living way, all the way back to the most holy place. Hallelujah. All right. So let's go to our last verse. That's why God says, keep your garment, please. Cherish your garment that I've already given you. Keep them white. Let's go to uh, last verse will tell us what the garment is. Okay, it's, it ain't no Armani or it ain't no, you know, fur clothes, okay? What is the garment? Let's all turn to Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. Let's read this in faith. Ready, begin. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Amen, right? Although this garment is invisible, you are wearing the most expensive garment in the whole wide world, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Right? So have confidence. Take pride. And exactly know, you know, you can't tell what you do by the clothes you wear. Like for example, surgeons wear surgeon clothes, right? Scrubs, right? Police officers wear uh, police uniform. Soldiers wear, you know, uh, B BDU. Oh, ACU, now ACU, right? Doctors wear a white gown. Who was this Joshua? He was a priest. Ketonet is priestly garment, right? What do priests do? They live in the house of God. They serve God, Abad. They keep God's house, Shamar, right? That's what all of you guys, most of you I know, you guys really spend lots of time at church, right? The real house of God in this end time. Right. So, please know you're living the fulfillment of the prophecy itself. God already pre prophesied, I'm going to create this race of people who are going to be my priests, my Levites, my ministers, my servants who will be with me in my house forever. Okay, let's go to Isaiah chapter 61 verse 6. Okay, Isaiah chapter 61, verse 6. Ready, begin. But you will be called the priest of the Lord. You will be spoken of as ministers of our God. You will eat the wealth of the nations, and in their riches you will boast. Amen, right? Okay, not only pastors and evangelists are priests and the ministers. When we say ministers of God, it includes all of us, right? And that's what 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Ready, last verse. Ready, begin. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Brothers and sisters, we are wearing this nice fine garment now. But let us look around. There are many people who are torn into pieces because they just cannot get over the shame, the nakedness, right? May we share them this marvelous light that we are in, not because of what we did, but because of who he is, 
right? Then we are giving them the greatest gift to them as well, this beautiful white garment of Jesus Christ. Let's help our brothers and sisters wear the same garment all around us. Amen. Okay, let's close with a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, God, what blessing this is that you have reminded us once again of this grand work of restoration. You are taking us right back to the original world where we live as your precious ministers, as we live in such an intimate fellowship with you in your house, in your garden of happiness and joy. Father, help us to keep our white garments clean. And also Revelation chapter 7 taught us the way to keep our garments white. And that is by washing it in the blood of the Lamb, Father. Help us to really deck ourselves, adorn ourselves as your bride. And as we do so, help us to also become the mighty proclaimers of this marvelous light that you have brought us into. So that we can also help one another wearing this beautiful, clean, white garment to really partake in this great joy happiness, and the blessing that you have given us without price. We thank you so much. We pray all of this in the precious name of our one and only Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's give all the glory to our Father God.